<laughs> All right, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm Cecile, and I'm the coordinator of the Maji Centre at Nate. At Nate, we honour and acknowledge that the land on which we learn, work and live is Treaty 6 territory. This place is a traditional homeland for the First Nations and Métis peoples. And today we are all part of this treaty land. The traditional name of this place is Amiskwachiwaskigan, which we also call the City of Edmonton. Um, happy to welcome my colleague and cohort and, um, well, everything great, uh, Dale who is our executive in residence uh, at Nate and working with our student entrepreneurs. He has several years of experience working with small businesses and startups. He came to us um, previously with the business link um, and then before that, lots of experience. I did not realize, Dale, that you actually worked with BlackBerry before. That was my favorite phone. I loved the keyboard, but I hated how it crashed every time I tried to go on the internet. Hated it. <laughs> anyway, I, <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to pass it over to you now. Awesome. And you guys were all witnesses. Cecile just called me her everything, which is uh, makes things a little awkward. I won't lie. Uh, uh, special hello to, to Garrett, who literally does this for a living and uh, uh, will we'll now be here to mostly mock me if I say anything wrong. So thanks, Garrett, for coming out. <laughs> all right, I'm going to go ahead and share a screen because we, we never have enough time in these sessions. Uh, and throw it up to full screen and I assume everything looks just fine because, you know, why not? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Perfect, guys. So, so we are some stuff. Great. So, yeah, we're here to talk about the basically the essential elements of a marketing plan. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to introduce. Hang on. No, that's not working. Switch screens here. There we go. Just want to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Dale Schaub. I'm Nate's executive in residence, aka Cecile's everything. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I run the the Blue Book program uh, at at the Maji Center, which is all is our kind of our pre accelerator program. So we actually have a, a cohort of students who are working through the program. They all started with an idea, and uh, hopefully we'll get them to launch or or or, or close to by the end of the whole thing. Uh, so who am I? I'm I'm uh, Kind of a startup specialist, I think is probably the best way to describe it. Uh, I focus most of my my training and stuff like that is focused on early stage, and I've really worked with hundreds of different clients in a variety of different industries. I've been doing consulting work for about five plus years, probably closer to six now. Uh, Fifteen years in sales and marketing, uh, and including you know consulting with a wide variety of the different folks. Uh, I included some images around. Of some of the different companies that I've worked with or for over the years, uh, and yeah, I'm a Nate grad. And took marketing, and then you know took a bunch of additional training uh, to kind of get me to where I'm at. But I thought I'd spare you the boring details. I'm also an entrepreneur. Business number one, which was about ten years ago, was me running around in a truck, and I used to uh, do snack foods, potato chips, sun sunflower seeds, peanuts, those types of things. Sold them into uh, super, you know, uh, grocery stores, gas stations, a wide variety of different things like that. And I ended up doing that for about six years. Uh, much later on, started my own consulting business, and uh, yeah, been uh, uh, happily working with Cecile Tamaji Center ever since. The boring stuff, if anybody's interested. So I'm actually working with the Tamaji Center through a grant program and there's some folks there who are paying for it and paying me. Uh, and I actually work with the Maji Center for only 20 hours a week, uh, even though it feels like much longer than that. And uh, the other rest of the time I'm over at Norquest uh, helping their students out with similar stuff. All right, so let's talk a little bit about a marketing plan and what is a, an actual marketing plan for. So, uh, Let's see if I can move some, some things around here. So a marketing plan is really all about just outlining the foundation of your marketing, all right? So, so if we're building a house, we're literally laying the groundwork, the concrete, uh, you know, before we build the house on top of it. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't necessarily, so I know a lot of folks perhaps on this call are here to learn the next best way to do advertising or promotions for their business. But the marketing plan doesn't really 
cover that, or at least it's certainly not the focus. Uh, it will definitely include that, um, but it's perhaps a much smaller section than you think. And so very broadly, I've, I've included, um, you know, the, the, the main categories, which I see, which are market research, uh, target audiences, uh, and various marketing strategies. Now, because we do have some time limitations here today, I'm not going to do a lot of detail into any of these. Mostly want to do like a high level version of everything. Um, yeah, so so anyway, I just wanted to warn you that this is a, a thoroughly deep and, and uh, subject that I will now be taking a very high level of and will not certainly do it anywhere near the justice that it deserves. So let's start off with a bang here. Uh, what's wrong with this ad, everybody? Oh, it would be helpful if I could see the chat, wouldn't it? Cannot figure out how to see the chat. I can tell you uh, one person has said uh, it's too busy. Another person said the colors um, doesn't flow for the eye. Uh, not targeting the seniors. Okay, perfect. And I've gone ahead and screwed up my settings here. So give me a second There's, to figure out. <laughs> someone else said it looks like it's targeting uh, teenagers, um, not seniors. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 the big one that I was really hoping everybody would pick up on is that uh, the the content were was specifically aimed at seniors. Uh, and meanwhile, the image, the pictures, the the graphics, and everything like that uh, are, are definitely aimed for a different audience, right? And then, if, if anybody, bonus points for everybody for noticing the coupons. Uh, which are probably not something that 20 year olds utilize. I could be wrong. I, I, I'm not in touch with the 20 year old scene, uh, but generally speaking, seniors are more, more attracted more to the coupon set of things, right? So anyway, I include this as an example because this is, this is what happens when a marketing plan goes wrong. When you don't figure out who your customer is, what the messaging is that you wanna say, where your position is in the marketplace, uh, and instead, just maybe throw an ad together without actually, uh, you know, having it cohesive and aimed at the right type of customers. Maybe that one missed the boat. I don't know. So when we are, so let's start with a whole build of a marketing plan. And the very first thing that we always do is start with market research, which really deserves its own presentation. Uh, but I will do a very quick version of it. So why do we do market research first? Well. Uh, it's really to help understand who the customer is and, and you know what they're into. Uh, it helps to identify your competitors and what position they occupy in the marketplace and it helps you to learn more about the market. And a couple different ways that we actually do that are going to be through things like secondary market research, which is research compiled and published by others. So if you were to Google information, uh, about your industry or about your customers or anything like that, that would be considered secondary market research. And again, I've included some different versions at the bottom, but if you did want some, if anybody listening uh, wants to know where to find secondary market research, feel free to email me and I'll send you a list. And secondary market research is mostly useful to help with the size of the market. So who and what is in an area uh, um, what types of customers uh, and any trends that are affecting an industry. All right. The other way. So if you, if you figured out the secondary market research is the second type of market research gold star. The 1st, 1 is going to be that primary market research. And this is research where you would conduct yourself. Uh, most of the time it would involve you going out talking to people. Um, you know, uh, getting feedback from them, doing focus groups, uh, doing uh, surveys, online surveys, that sort of work. So the main things that you can get out of primary market research is to help to determine a customer's thoughts and feelings about your product or service, 
their price tolerance. You can actually get a pretty good idea of how much they would be willing to pay or what the most is that they'd be willing to pay. And then any desire or market fit that they might have for a particular product, as well as determining what some of their past buying behaviors are, right? And so this is all really great information. And we start with the market research because then that helps us to figure out who our target audience is. All right, so who's our target? What is a target audience? You may be asking. And a target audience is, is literally a, a small group of people who are most likely to buy your product or service, all right? And so what we actually do is we identify a niche group or a narrow focus of a group and we sell to them. Uh, most importantly, a target audience is absolutely not everyone. So if somebody asks you who your customer is or who your target audience, your target market is, uh, never answer everyone uh, because you know it's, it's just too much. All right, so let me give you a couple of examples on this because I find that target audiences are a concept that trips people up a little bit. So I've pulled these ads off the old interweb. Uh, for Smitty's, the, the delightful restaurant uh, that we've probably all eaten in. And um, anyway, I, I'm going to hit that chat function again, even though I can't actually see what you guys are writing. Um, but yeah, who, who are Smitty's customers, everyone? And then based on these, these ads here, who would you say that they're targeting? Nothing yet. Okay, seniors, 65 plus, as Chris says, um, is maybe who they're targeting. Yeah, and the absolutely. Ads, and the ads. Absolutely. Uh, middle to older people, some people said middle age seniors, seniors who want to hang out with friends and drink bottomless coffee, parents and their friends, 40 Perfect. plus. All right, and so, so follow-up question. Most of the folks in this audience, judging by the, the, the faces I was able to see at the top of this presentation, uh, seem to be a little bit on the younger side. Uh, do these ads say, wow, I really wanna go to Smitty's for you guys? I'm nope. seeing some no's. A big hard no. <laughs> <laughs> nope, not at all. Exactly, exactly, right? So obviously Smitty's, and if you've been into a Smitty's, this is not a surprise at all. Everything about Smitty's screams senior citizens, right down to the staff, the music they're playing, the decor, right? Nothing about Smitty says, this is where I wanna take a hot date to, all right? And that's fine. This is where their customers are, right? Their customers literally are the seniors soaking up that free coffee on a Sunday morning. All right, so, and that's fine. So now let's contrast that with a different company. Uh, anybody ever go to Woodshed, Woodshed Burgers? They actually have two locations in Edmonton. Uh, fantastic burger, if you've never had it, gotta support the locals. Uh, guys, who, who are Woodshed's customers based on these images? And while you're typing, I'll point out that the image on the left is actually the inside of the restaurant. Uh, and they've got one heck of an awesome mural in there. Uh, and then, yeah, obviously an ad on the right. <laughs> so I'm seeing some seeing younger men. Okay, interesting. Uh, and so I'm seeing an age range of about uh, 20 to 30 young hipsters like Cecile uh, and, and otherwise generally cool people. Um, yeah, I mean, so. And let me ask here, and, and I'm almost wondering if you guys are almost a, too, a little too young for the audience based on your responses, but does this appeal to you? Does this make you say, you know what, I actually wouldn't mind trying a woodshed burger? Yeah, okay, good. Seeing lots of yeses, and that is the correct answer because the burgers are fantastic. <laughs> so, right, so now we're, so just kind of broadly, I want to bring this all back here. So when we're literally talking about two very distinct restaurant groups here. And both of these groups, right? Like, so if, if I'm opening a restaurant and you're now saying, Dale, my, my restaurant's gonna appeal to everybody, right? Well, suddenly here's two very dramatically different examples, definitely on the extreme side, who, who, who you're like, okay, well, you know, here they, you know, like 
would a senior, I guess, uh, you don't have to type this one out, but would a senior want to walk in and, and, you know, see a burger monster eating, you know, uh, characters from McDonald's on the mural, right? Is that big burger going to appeal to, to a senior's market? And I'll answer for you, no, probably not, right? And so if you walk in there, you know, there's going to be some cool craft beers. There's going to be some 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 top 40 music playing, right? And that's not necessarily going to be built for the senior audience. So this is what I'm talking about when we're saying, who's your target us audience? Um, now, a couple more things about it. First of all, why do we, why do we do target audiences? Well, you don't have endless marketing dollars. Literally, nobody does. If you look at the largest corporations in the world, they do not sell to everyone. Uh, and feel free to come up with an example and we can talk about it. But I've thought about this one a lot. And maybe one company that comes to mind that has one of the broader audiences I can think of would be something like a Pepsi or a Coke, right? And so even Pepsi or Coke, if you think about it, literally their product is consumed by everybody, but they very rarely, or not, I can't think of a single time where they sold to children. I can't think of a single time where their ads maybe appeal to senior citizens, right? And, and Coke has got to be one of the, the broadest audiences out there in terms of their consumers. Uh, even they seem to target like a 30 something audience uh, and give you good feels. So anyway, you don't have endless marketing dollars. And so we really have to be careful where we spend it. And when we do spend those marketing dollars, it has to be aimed at uh, a, a very small niche group. Also, your product or your service will be wanted by some and less by others. So keep that in mind. And it's really hard and expensive to sell to everyone. And this is one we never talk about in marketing. People generally need to see ads multiple times before they're willing to commit or buy. And you're saying, oh, that's not true, Dale. I saw an ad. But yeah, you probably saw that ad five times before you, you noticed it, right, or it clicked. And the number that I remember from way back in marketing school 25 years ago was about 13 times the average time that somebody needs to see an ad before it actually clicks in. But who knows, that data could be way out of whack these days. All right, saw this quote, thought this is it. This is perfectly encapsulates it. Uh, Alejandro Kermatis uh, wrote, trying to capture an entire market without first targeting several niches price points, customer sizes, or geo areas for rollout is going to be financial suicide for the vast majority of entrepreneurs. So in summary, marketing to a small group who is most likely to buy is more efficient and smarter. All right, so you might be asking, all right, Dale, how do we make a smaller group? How do we make a target audience? And it's really these four categories that we traditionally group people into. And they will be geographic, so where is the customer located? Demographic, who are they? Behavioral, how do they buy? Psychographic, what do they do? All right, so let's break those down a little bit more because this is an important concept. So when I'm talking about geographic, where are they located? So what, what region do they, are they? What town are they in? What city are they in? What province are they in? Right. If you're selling online, it still could be, you know, what country you're in, because you don't want to ship outside of of Canada. But you even still can can narrow that down into major urban or rural centers. Right. Rural or urban. What's the population? Are there any environmental barriers? All right. And that's a funny one. Uh, people uh, online who are from Edmonton might know about one of our major environmental barriers which is, have you ever talked to somebody and said, hey, let's meet here, and they say, oh, no, I can't go across the river, right? Edmontonians will know that one. There's a north-south divide. People don't cross the river. And so that might actually be a barrier or, or a way that you want to separate. So if you've got a white Av store location, uh, even though it may make sense to sell to Jasper, to folks in the downtown area and advertise to them, they may not want to cross that river. So it actually might be easier to go even as far as Argyle to sell uh, rather than to, to, to broach the river. So anyway, environmental barriers, one of those quirks. All right. Demographic data. We all know this one. All right. If you're going to separate by age, 
do it 10 years, 15 years max, because any difference beyond that, you're certainly suddenly getting a very different person that you're going to be targeting to. Your gender could be male, female primarily, or could be a mix of both. What do they do for a living? You know, are they middle class? Are they high end? How big is their family or do they have a family? What's their ethnicity, right? Behavioral, how do they shop? Do they have brand loyalty? How often do they purchase things, right? Once a year, once a month, once a week? Uh, how, what are they looking for when they're actually buying? What benefits are they seeking? And how ready are they to purchase? Do they have to do a bunch of research first? Or is this gonna be like an impulse buy for them? And then finally, psychographics, really all about the personalities, the lifestyles and the attitudes of the folks. All right, so I, I realize this is really broad and maybe it's not clicking in. So I decided to go ahead and create a, a really high end, a high level target audience. Uh, obviously, we, we want to do a little bit more detail when, when we're actually doing this. Uh, and so I actually came up with an example, uh, which is, of course, the Maji Center. Who is the Maji Center's target audience? Now, for folks who may not know who, who's presenting this presentation, Maji Center is actually Nate's incubator, uh, and we actually teach students how to, to start their extracurricular business and help them grow it. So, uh, again, I do want to point out this. I'm just, this is real top, real high level. Uh, and then uh, the second thing I want to point out too is the number one question I get is, from here is, okay, well, how do we how do we come up with this? And yet part of it's science, right? We saw that market research and that market research is gonna be able to help you understand your regions and your markets. Uh, and then the other half of that too is, you know, a little bit of, you know, pop psychology and, and, and your general understanding of people. Uh, target audience isn't written in stone. You can tweak it. Uh, you can make adjustments based on the results. All right, so let's dig into it a little bit here. So, Maji Center's target audience, geographic. All right, obviously they're gonna be, most of them are, most of the students are gonna be in Edmonton. Uh, that's not always true. I know that there's several folks uh, that I work with out of BC or Spruce Grove, but I would say, you know, a good percentage of students uh, that work through the Maji Center can be similar to Nate, where they're gonna live in Edmonton, but maybe in various parts of the city. Uh, but they may conjugate in the general Nate region within a 15 minute drive, mostly an urban setting. Uh, and then I would say, you know, if we really want to try to make this a smaller group, which we generally do, they may attend school specifically in the cat building, uh, which houses a lot of the business students and is also the location of the Maji Center itself. So, so, you know, we, we may want to specifically target that group. From a demographic viewpoint, I would say students interested in entrepreneurship maybe skew slightly higher uh, and would be in the 20 to 30 year mix. Uh, gender, I would say we get an even mix of men and women coming through. Occupation, just about uh, obviously full-time student right across the board, the majority. Socioeconomic, poor student, it's a cliche, but a lot of the folks uh, do not have a ton of money. Uh, ethnicity, Nate's a surprisingly ethnically diverse school, and we I would say that is very mixed. Uh, and then one other demographic trait, in this case, uh, likely taking one of three courses. They're either taking business, uh, Bachelor of Technology, or DMIT, uh, which we know, Cecile and I know, uh, based on our statistics, uh, who's most likely to be into entrepreneurship, right? Behavioral. Uh, why? How do they buy? So, so they're going to be curious about the services available. They may wander into the Maji Center saying, hey, what's this about? Or um, in general, they're going to be interested in entrepreneurship uh, and they're going to access us by stopping in or maybe attending a free event. Our ideal customer are going to be folks who are really engaged. So they're going to be really keen on entrepreneurship uh, and they're going to want to continue to to do it so much so that they've, they've actually engaged or wanted to want to engage uh, with, with our services and our offerings. And then psychographic, uh, right? They, they're gonna be interested in entrepreneurship. Uh, they're gonna have an idea or an existing business. Probably their parents have a business. Statistics say that 
folks who are get entrepreneurial at a young age usually have some sort of family connection to it. Um, our best, best uh, Maji Center students are driven. They're even competitive. Uh, they're going to be really trainable and they're, they're going to be interested in learning. Uh, and yeah, they may even like enjoy things like competitive sports. I don't know. I don't know if I, I hit the nail with the folks on this one, but you know, that, that seems to be a, a logical extension. All right, so, so that would be my target audience. And hopefully after me going through that, you can kind of picture who the Maji Center's kind of key target audience might end up being. So a couple just key points on target audience. Um, it is common to have two or even three target audiences as long as they're distinctly different from everybody else, okay? Uh, I would say a max of two and only go to three if there's a business to business component. So for example, if Cecile wanted to do a target audience of potential donors to the Maji Center, she may want to create that third target audience uh, who, who, would, who would be consist of nothing but our, our potential donors, right? So that would be an example. Um, make sure that if you are doing target audiences, they are very different from each other. They have different rationales, different reasons for doing what they're doing. They're not just like a different age group or something like that. Uh, and then, yeah, marketers, they love to develop personas. They're nicknames for each of those groups, right? Uh, I, I like, I always like my practical names, like, you know, uh, Maji's ideal students, uh, but you could just as easily nickname one of the personas Fred. And then when you're talking with with your coworkers or, or your co-founders, uh, you can talk about your your persona Fred that you're working to target. So anyway, if you, if you ever hear that, that's what that is as a nickname or persona. All right. So once we've done that, once we've created a target audience, and Cecile, stop me if if there's any questions about the target audience at this stage. We're good. Okay. Then we then move to positioning, all right? Sometimes known as market strategy, sometimes known as the four Ps, and you'll see why shortly. And this is all about how we are gonna position our business in the marketplace. And this is something we think about before we actually launch everybody. So when I was talking about positioning, I'm talking about literally where in the market you're located. And so uh, I, I've used a basic version of this here by comparing price, versus quality on various early stage consulting services uh, in the, the Edmonton region. And you can see me and my business up in the top right corner and other folks in, in different areas, right? And so that's gonna be the rough idea, right? I could try to compete with the low price guys, but then I would have to give up on maybe some quality uh, or I could try to compete uh, with quality, but I'm gonna have to charge more because it's gonna take more time. Anyway, that's one real basic way to help you understand what we're talking about when we're talking about positioning. So the four Ps, here they are, product, price, place, and promotion. Uh, some marketing experts um, tell, may tell you that there's more of them, um, but I'm old school, so I'm gonna stick with the four. And what they really are, are gonna be this. So product is gonna be what space your product occupies, just in terms of what it is that you're offering high-end, discount, et cetera. And what are the key features of your product that puts you in that space? Place is gonna be where you sell it, online, retail stores, et cetera. Price, how much you're gonna sell it for and why, what's your justification for a high-end price, a low-end price, and promotion, which is gonna be how you're gonna promote it. And that's the stuff that perhaps some of you are here for is gonna be some of those different advertising strategies. So the key with all of these is gonna be that they tie together, all right? So if I'm gonna be offering a world-class awesome product, I better make sure that the place, the price, and the promotion strategies all make sense with that, all right? And that's a tough concept, but let's let's maybe give you an example here and we'll, we'll work through another one here. All right, so let's stick with the Maji Center since we all know and love it. Uh, and so for product, uh, I'm going to say that Maji Center mostly focuses on early stage business training. That's what we're going to mostly focus our services on. Uh, we may offer things like competitor competitions and stuff like that to engage the students. Uh, and then, yeah, coaching, internal and external coaching is going to be a part of our product offering. 
All right, this is where we separate from a lot of folks um, free. So because we are aiming at the, the poor student market, then, then all of our stuff is going to be free. Uh, and in fact, we want to incentivize a lot of things. So, so we, we find ways to pay students to complete things, to compete, to win prizes, to attend things, right? And so those are going to be all parts of our pricing strategy. Our play strategy, well, we want to be give students as many options as we can uh, for you know how they're going to access our services. So in person, hopefully one day we'll return to, uh, but currently also offering online delivery. And we even have a course on Moodle. Uh, and everything's self-paced. So students can work through any of the work that we give them at their own pace, uh, with some exceptions, right? So we do give you some options. In terms of how you would do it, so those are going to be some some place strategies, uh, and then promotions. Well, how do we promote Maji Center services? We have an internal an internal to Nate newsletter, uh, classroom presentations. We do free presentations like the one you're attending now, uh, and we do social media, right? So that's how we're going to promote it. Okay, so let's um, let's get that chat box going again, uh, and I can kind of see it flash in the top right hand corner here. So. So we'll see what that looks like, but let's start with a high end product. So let's pretend that I am now selling a super high end uh, handcrafted wood clock. I don't know why, but that's what we're selling. All right, what would the pricing strategy be if I was selling a handcrafted wood product? Really, would it be a low price? Would it be a high price, a medium price? Uh, what would be your thoughts on, on, on a high end wood product? Yeah, so you would expect to see some high pricing on that, absolutely. Uh, another pricing strategy is maybe I would offer a, a warranty on that. So that might be another example of a price uh, strategy that I would put on that product. Where would be my place strategy? So this would be a tougher one. Where would you expect to buy a, a handcrafted wooden clock? A little more pausing on this one. Cecile's has a small boutique store. Absolutely. Furniture, high-end furniture store. Excellent. Handmade store. Daniel says online. Natalie says online. So, so potentially these days, uh, yeah, online might work, but we normally wouldn't think of a, a high-end product being sold online. Mm. You certainly can do it that way, uh, but online does tend to have a little bit more of a reputation for being a low-end product. So anyway, I might think back and forth on that one as to whether or not online would be the right fit for, for my ha handcrafted uh, clocks, right? Makes sense? And then promotion. How would I promote the high-end product, right? Is there anything that... Uh, uh, you know, that, that makes sense from a high-end products perspective in terms of how I might might run promotions for it. So lots, lots of different options, but the one thing that, you know, I'll, I'll recommend is that, that we kind of keep things classy when we are advertising uh, and that, you know, we, we may want to drive people to a store for a high-end sales type product. Anyway. We're running out of time, so I'll, I'll kind of leave it there. Um, but I did want to add some extra kind of content in there as well. So I know that there's several of you who are who are here for, you know, the how could I promote my business? So so I went ahead and threw in some extra slides for you. You are welcome. So here are my best ways to promote your business, depending on how it is, what kind of products you actually um, are doing. So. And this is not a thorough and, and, and completely complete list, just merely some brainstorming. But if you are uh, a, an e-commerce business and you are selling physical goods, you may want to consider Instagram or Facebook ads, organic social media, public relations, public relations, influencers. And also, and you'll notice that line at the bottom of the next few slides, these are going to be dependent on the type of physical goods uh, that that you do have so Pinterest ad, AdWords or Google Shopping, all right? Okay, mobile apps, Dale. I'm selling a mobile app. What are some of the better channels? Instagram, Facebook, Apple Search, which is 
going to be on the App Store, I believe. I don't have an Apple device, but I'm pretty sure that's what that is. Uh, Snapchat ads, TapJoy uh, referrals, TapJoy's uh, um, little advertising uh, that shows up in, in websites and stuff like that. Uh, if I'm selling software, software as a service, SaaS, Facebook ads, content, product-led growth, that's when you get, uh, when you offer something for free and then uh, do paid upgrades. Uh, AdWords and partnerships are also a good way to sell that. Uh, if I have a brick and mortar store, so a literal physical store, what are some of the best ways to sell to consumers? Facebook, Instagram, Yelp ads, public relations, uh, also potentially Snapchat, Google AdWords, Google Display ads, and affiliate programs. All right, business to business. All right, so if I've got a niche business to business, so really specific customer, but it's a high revenue product per user. So if I'm like selling 10K at, a, at the, uh, per product, sales, sales is king. Everything else is distant, but we also include content. You might get a few folks from like webinars, partnerships, Google, uh, Google and Facebook ads, and, and potentially Instagram ads, depending on the product. If I've got a broad business to business uh, with medium revenue per user, uh, for example, like $150 a month in software, some of the better ways, content, webinars, partnerships, ad, Facebook ads, Google AdWords, and then distantly sales, you might want to lean a little bit more heavily uh, on, on the, uh, the online ads for this. If I've got a niche business to business with low revenue per user. So if I'm, for example, offering a $25 per month service, I'm going to want to try to keep my ad costs down um, because it is niche. Uh, and so word of mouth, community building, product led growth and content are some of the cheaper ways on this list to actually generate. And then contrast that with broad. If I have a broad product with low revenue, then you know I can get away with content marketing, AdWords, product-led growth, search ads, partnerships, referrals. All right, I hope that was of some use to those of you who, uh, uh, and yeah, absolutely, Cecile, it's, uh, it, it's uh, TikTok, probably not for businesses, business to business, which is this one. But yeah, low business to consumer certainly could be an avenue. Uh, there's definitely a bunch of stuff I'm missing in here. Um, but anyway, just to give you a rough idea. And, and if anybody, I went real fast through that just due to time. If anybody wants these slides, uh, just send me an email. I'll be happy to, to send it all over. Okay. I want to, I, I was like, you know what? I want to include messaging because messaging is so important. And while technically not really part of a marketing plan it, it is a plan on how you want to communicate or speak to your uh, to your business when you are talking to somebody so that you are speaking in a way that is relevant to your audience all right and so when we break down i want to talk about two things a unique value proposition and then a unique selling proposition so a uvp which is what this one is more commonly called is just a tight phrase uh, that describes this, what what results customers get from using your product or service. And if it helps to think of it as, you know, a way to communicate in terms of sales or, or something you put on your advertising, uh, then that's really what a UVP is all about, is, is all about the customers using your product or service. Okay, some key points of the UVP. It's really a clear way to answer the question, what does your business do? Uh, it is short and simple, usually a sentence or two max, and it's going to demonstrate your business's personalities, strengths, and identity. Uh, in this case, the UVP refers to the whole company rather than one specific offer. And as always, I've included an example, and as always, my one example is all about the Maji Center. So uh, I quickly wrote out, and it probably could be refined, that the Maji Center is your early stage business specialist that teaches testing to have more successful startups, lo startup launches and lower costs. Uh, and I probably could have included some reference to Nate and students now that I look at it with fresh eyes. But anyway, that's an example of a, of a UVP that separates us from everybody else uh, and, and is, is just a nice tight way to describe the, what the Maji Center does, okay? USP, a unique selling proposition, 
is uh, going to be very similar, but it's going to be specifically uh, why your product or service is better than the other companies, right? And so this is really about a specific service or product rather than the company as a whole. Uh, and I really like the way one uh, site called it, which is a promise, an implied or expressed promise that you're making to a customer. And it stresses the differences between you and your competitors. And there was a nice little template that, that I, I put on this slide. Your brand blank off, uh, offers product service for target market to buy a proposition. Unlike competitor, we key differentiator. Uh, so I like that. And so what I did was I came up with my own, but I completely reworded it. Uh, and so it goes a little something like this. Uh, stop waiting. Go from I have an idea to your own business in only 14 weeks with the with Blue Book training by the Maji Center. Um, and if you'll notice carefully, you'll see that I actually do include all of the elements. They just aren't in the same order as the template, right? So I, I the brand, the Maji Center pro offers product service, Blue Book training for target market, which is in this case gonna be anybody who's waiting or, or, or hasn't you know actually moved forward with their business idea. Um, you know, in only 14 weeks uh, is, is starting a business, uh, unlike competitor, which is doing nothing, um, right? So, so anyway, just a, a simple way to say why we're different and why people should pay attention to us. All right, so the UVP and the USP are used to communicate information about your business. Uh, and a lot of the times this stuff can be used to appear on your website and your advertising and your sales pitches because it's such a succinct way to put to you know to describe your business and to describe its advantages uh and yeah it's it's really just uh, something that you should take the time to actually write out because i feel like it's important to better explain your business that's it all right so i have finished with 12 45 which i think is always the goal time to finish so yay presentation um, jot down my information. If anybody wants the slides, feel free to email me. Oh, I just realized I've got the wrong darn email address on there. Uh, so let's just close this out and I'll put my, my real one. In the chat, if anybody wants to email me for the slides or anything like that, oh, beat you to it, Cecile. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Garrett, did you learn anything today? No? Lots. <laughs> Great presentation, Bill. <laughs> Thanks, Garrett, appreciate that. <laughs> no questions, you guys are all marketing pros now. Awesome. I, I fully expect to see everybody's, uh, um, uh, feel free to submit all your marketing plans to me for a review. No, I, I don't think I had the time for that, but many of you can. Any of you who are Nate students, I, I will accept them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, how do you determine the percentage to use in promoting? Um, there is probably no static answer to that unless Garrett disagrees with me. And in that case, he is correct. Um, but generally, I would, uh, you know, I, the one I like to use is uh, the, you know, the comparison. So if you, you know, if you, you sh okay, how do, I, how do I answer this one? This is a tough one. I, I, the honest answer is it really just depends on the product or service that you're offering, what specific industries you're in, uh, a lot of different things. Um, but I would encourage you to like experiment a little bit with it, right? raise a little bit of extra money, you know, put a little extra money into it, see what your results are. And at a certain point, you're gonna get diminished results depending on the amount of money that you're putting in. And once you kind of hit that point, then, then you've kind of discovered a little bit of a sweet spot. Um, so I would encourage you to play around with, with the amount of money uh, to promote. Uh, and I would encourage you as well to play around with your content, to play around with your advertising. Uh, we love testing, as I'd mentioned in, in the USP. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, play, experiment with it. Uh, don't blow a bunch of money uh, until you've actually proven that one thing is better than the other. Oh, uh, 
marketing plans in specific sectors are heavily regulated by compliance. Well, there certainly are a number of different industries that are that have heavy regulations. Um, and obviously marketing plans are gonna be quite you know, internal and internal document to kind of guide the company's directions. So I'm not quite sure I'm feeling you there, although there are specific sectors that do have limitations on um, uh, advertising, uh, you know, alcohol, gaming, cannabis are, are the couple ones that, that pop to mind that are going to have lots of different rules around that. Uh, what do I think of Facebook ads? Yeah, um, Facebook ads uh, used to be a fantastic way to advertise. Uh, I hear that they are not quite as effective anymore. Uh, with with some of the the, the changes that uh, that Apple has made, interestingly, uh, so use with caution these days. Uh, I'm not quite sure anybody's really kind of found a workaround for that. So so um, maybe context is needed here. But basically, Apple allows users to now opt out of sharing their data, and that data used to be incredibly valuable to target ads to people. And so now, uh, yeah, Facebook ads. Eh, not as good as they used to be, and and uh, yeah, uh, the Facebook stock has is reflecting that. Yeah, Katie, good point. Yeah, the those rules those rules have changed. Yeah, pharmaceuticals. That's a good point, Cecilia. Yeah, that's another one with with specific rules. Really, dentists as well. Eh? I didn't know they had a bunch of advertising rules. I assume that's still in reference to Katie's question. Interesting. All right. Any other questions? You guys all got target marketing. Eh? That made sense. I've, I've I've literally done like versions of this presentation and it messes people up. People just can't wrap their brain around not advertising to everybody. <laughs> I don't know why. I always think it's like, this is a simple concept. It makes a lot of sense to me. But uh, yeah, a lot of folks really get tripped up by that. But no, we got a smart group. That's awesome. Maybe just one thing, Dale, in that uh, seniors ad that you had for Smitty's on the right hand side, bottom right banner, there's also an application to download the application for seniors. And to be honest, I don't know how many seniors would be downloading the app on their smartphone for Smitty's. And if they are, congrats, but I don't see that happening too often or not. So I don't know why you would advertise the app to seniors, right? That's a good point. Yeah, they, they must have, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that they probably saw even with a, like a low level of engagement, that, that, that if they put like a bunch of coupons on there, like that's how they coupon, it might convince a few folks like my parents to download it. Um, these days, seniors aren't quite as old as they used to be. Uh, so, you know, like both of my parents who were technologically terrible 20, 30 years ago, you know, now have all the latest devices and are not half bad at it. So, so maybe that market's uh, emerging a little bit differently. Uh, how do I evaluate how effective the newspaper can be? Actually, that's a fantastic question, Barbara. Uh, I used to work for this company. Uh, some of you may have heard of it. It's called Yellow Pages. Um, now it may or may not be an obsolete term nowadays. So, um, But what they started to do right at the end, and I believe they can still continue to do, um, is that they'd run separate phone numbers and separate uh, website addresses. So... Um, literally they, they mirror. All right. So let's pretend I set up a, like a separate web address for my, for my company and it redirects everybody to my main web page. And then I run an ad and I send people to that second web address. Well, suddenly I know how effective that ad is, even if it's in print, because I know how many people have gone through the other web page. All right. The other one is, is a phone number. So you, you could even put uh, one of your, other company numbers and then you can see how many people are phoning directly to that second phone number anyway it's um there are some services online i forget who they are but they they'll actually redirect phone numbers for you and, and uh and count that as well um but that would be one way to to do it i guess the other way to do it might be just to compare so if you do nothing else but run newspaper ads you can see how much it moves the needle in, in terms of uh, you know people reaching out to you, uh, and so that would be a, a less a less elegant but still effective way to get it done. Any other questions? 
and everybody, even non-students are free to reach out to me. Uh, I'd be more than happy to chat with you about what you're working on. Um, dangerous offer, but rarely is it taken advantage of. So yeah, I'm more than happy to chat with you more about your marketing or your specific business. Happy to do that. Awesome. Well, as there's no other questions, we'll wrap it up. Um, unless something comes through, no, just thanks. So thank you so much, Dale, for putting this together, even though your little poor little doggy almost got munched out yesterday by that pit bull, that mean little pit bull. Um, but you have a great weekend and thank you everybody for joining us today as well. Thanks everyone.